Amanda, I thought that the synthesized performance was just fine. Little did I know, my goodness, this was thrilling. Thank you so much to both of you for allowing me to uh, to witness this. Thank you so much for coming over here, Matt, especially with your busy week. It's been extraordinary, the day. And you're right, after living with an electronic score for five years, to have the life breathed into this music is um, speechless, you know. It was interesting. I didn't know what my reaction was going to be. And little did I realize I felt I had come home. Uh. Magic. Absolute Mm. magic. And a miracle. I mean, there's just been so many miracles surrounding this project. And Marin even being involved in this project is a miracle. And then to to line up the diaries of LSO, the best orchestra on the planet, Mm. with the best conductor on the planet – you know, need I say more? And she's just finessed her brilliance into this day, and it is going to be extraordinary, you know, once we hear the choir lay down with these incredible takes today. Extraordinary is the word for it. Watching this experience, um, watching you swing that baton and bring this together, why did you choose to to take this on? You, you have your choice of uh, orchestras and uh, selections to, uh, to record and perform. Well, as you very well know, Amanda is uh, an incredibly convincing human being. (laughs) And uh, besides being extremely gifted and talented and a wonderful composer and uh, every obstacle that we came up against, uh, the the reason I was able to get involved really was because of COVID. I had no free time in my diary whatsoever. And then I read her email you know, because I was killing time during COVID like everybody was. And I wrote back to her. I said, oh, what is this project? And that's how it got started. And then she came to Vienna and we we sort of did a practice trial run with it, see how it went in Vienna and became fast friends. And, uh, you know, and I have to say, you know, she also has this great advantage to having a husband who's also my assistant conductor, who's really helped, helped me with uh, the whole project as well. So it's it's really a dream project. I was also struck by exactly that, the collaborative nature of what we saw. I mean, when you record a a contemporary piece like this, do you frequently have the composer there to refer to? And we also had that voice of God, happens to be Amanda's husband, who was also helping us, uh, helping you to make sure this was exactly right. Well, it's that's the great um, luxury, I think, and, and advantage of doing uh, works by living composers. You know, they can – I mean, it's both the advantage and maybe sometimes the disadvantage, but um, they can be there and, and really be part of the process. But um, Paul's acting more as a producer, you know, mm. saying what we need downstairs. He's listening and, and using his excellent ears to help in that way. And Amanda's up in the studio with me so that she can help in that. So I really have the best of uh, all possible worlds, so to speak. What an ensemble. I mean, I, I couldn't see everyone, but I counted six percussionists, uh, two harps. This is just amazing. I, and I guess it's what this piece calls for, right, Amanda? Well, we're talking about space. And isn't space pretty epic? And so we need... Space is big. (laughs) Space is big. So you can't go sort of, you know, short changing your ensemble for, you know, trying to produce an epic piece like this. You you call on all forces to get the point across about these fascinating worlds and moons. And, and especially when you've got a moon like Io, which is the most volcanically mm. active moon in the solar system, you got to pull on all forces you can. So to get the message across. This is a representational piece. I mean, I think of other pieces like uh, Claude Debussy's uh, La Mer, The Sea, uh, even, you know, Beethoven. Uh, pastoral. The Pastoral, absolutely, The Sixth. And, of course, you can't avoid bringing up Gustav Holst. We're in his home nation, uh, the planets. But the planets was more of a metaphysical thing, whereas this, if I'm right, Amanda, you were really attempting to capture the true nature of these of these moons. And I've I'm so much in a more advantageous situation than Holst was. He didn't have the technology a hundred years ago like I have access to and all these deep space missions that they are achieving and succeeding in getting data back. I'm sure if he was alive right now, he'd probably be doing this sort of thing. Um, So I wanted to capitalise on the advancement of where we are with technology. And, you know, like I said, it's it's a situation where I came across the science and I I just couldn't ignore it. And Mm. hence why I've employed the, um, the choir to sing the science 
science. So this is very much what we call programmatic music, which talks about scenes and it's very unashamedly telling the story as opposed to an abstract, you know, approach to composing where you allow the audience to come up with their own story and dialogue. This is very much science driven. So it's like the script to tell the story, which is the science. I'd hope you can expand on that. I mean, where a piece like this fits into the the vast classical repertoire. Well, I think, as you um, so astutely mentioned, that, you know, The Planets by Holst, it's probably one of the most popular classical pieces in the repertoire. And yet, it doesn't really represent the planets. Mm -hmm. It's more about the gods from whom the planets derive their names. um, And as you said, it's more of a metaphysical than a a really science-based piece. I think something like this, the Moon Symphony, has a very strong possibility to become part of the repertoire because it also reaches out across disciplines. And, you know, it's a piece that we could use in educating kids. We can go out to schools. You know, we can speak to scientists. We can speak to – I mean, I had lunch with an astronaut today. I was pretty <laughs> excited. And I imagine I imagine that the way Amanda could build it out as a, as a complete project for orchestras it could be very fulfilling and also really establish the piece. Do you approach a symphony like this as you would any symphony, or is there a different way to approach it because it is, it represents um, things in the real world? No, I, you know, I think I approach it the same way. Every piece has a narrative, whether it's a literal narrative or a, a, an emotional narrative, and I have to find that narrative. This is easier mm. in a way because the narrative is clear, but uh, the challenges with this. Are, are very different because we have to keep a certain tempo so that we can put the chorus in later. It's a huge orchestra in a big space, and so we have the issues of delay. So, you know, it has its own kind of challenges. Amazing watching this come together. I mean, the, the quote that I do not want to use because this is not in sausage in any way, but you don't want to see the sausage being made. You've definitely, I wish everyone listening could have watched this process as it came together piece by piece, measure by measure. But I'm wondering, how do you do that when that major component of this symphony, the, the choral sections, are, are not available to you? I mean, how do you prepare it with those in mind? I think it's going to be phenomenal, and actually, it's going to work even better because we have the ability now to mix everything. You know, when you have everyone in one room and you're recording, say, 300 people at once, you can't get separation, so you can't really control things in the mix, as they call it. Uh, So I think that this is going to be even even more effective and more successful. And I should mention, I'm not sure Amanda knows this, but the boy soloist is the son of the principal bassoonist in the orchestra. And that's Leo, Amanda? Of course I knew this because (laughs) I have a beautiful, there's a beautiful story built into that bassoon solo because when I found out that um, Leo, our boy soloist for the seventh movement, um, his father is the principal bassoonist. I went, you're kidding me, because in that seventh movement, the bassoon, there's a little bassoon solo that hands off to the boy solo. Oh. It's a See, father. that is freaky. I that know. is freaky. <laughs> the project. This is, I know. So it's like, here you go, son. I've set you up, and now the stage is yours. I mean, But you know, um, uh, Dan, who's, uh, his dad, was telling me that this is very special also for Leo because his voice is just about to change. So this is probably the last project oh he'll be able to sing as a boy soprano. So it's very emotional, yeah. Do you feel about this ensemble the way we heard Amanda describing it? It's uh, Obviously, it's world class. I think it's a great orchestra, certainly. the uh, You know, for me, it's a very um, personal experience because I first met them with my teacher, Leonard Bernstein, when uh, he started the Pacific Music Festival in Sapporo in Japan. And that was 1990, before anyone was born. And, uh, and I wish. <laughs> and since then... I've had a relationship with this orchestra, and I stepped in in the mid-'90s, and from then on, I've been with the orchestra every every year, every other year. So we have a long-standing uh, history, which which is very, very, very wonderful. I've only had one experience 
where I worked with an orchestra on a performance. I got to, I had the tremendous honor of narrating uh, The Lincoln Portrait by Copeland. Oh, and I, it was the most terrifying <laughs> thing I have ever done voluntarily in my life. What is the feeling as you go into this kind of a project? Uh, is it the same every time? Is there some anxiousness, or is it just the joy of, of being part of it? Marin, I'll start with you. Well, I think, um, I mean, I think for someone to be thrown into the, the deep end, you know, like just having to narrate suddenly, I think it could be quite terrifying. But for us, you know, we we do this as part of our daily lives. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some anxiety or excitement or nervousness, I think. Yeah, I would call it more excitement. I, I don't feel particularly nervous. I think the thing that I really celebrate at this situation, with this situation, is that, you know, we've got the dream team basically dictating going forwards the tempos, the nuances, the, the characteristics, the sound, the quality, the excellence. And once we get this out there as a recording, it's going to be the benchmark of other orchestras and to emulate the type of brilliance that is coming from these days mm-hmm. recording. And with Marin weaving her magic into all of this, that is what is just worth, you know, really the perseverance and the pressure and just, mm-hmm. you know, nailing it all because we know that this is going to be the classic standard moving forwards. And I think that's what's really exciting. And and we'll catch our breath at the end of all this. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will for sure. But it's been, it's been a wonderful journey. And I think especially to, today at the recording sessions to have all of you scientists and, and explorers with us, uh, it, it was very moving, for not just for me, I think for the musicians too. What we will talk about on Monday uh, we, with a live audience is this intersection of art and science that share much more than I think a lot of people realize. I mean, is that something you recognize as well? Oh, absolutely. And I've been very involved uh, with uh, Brian Green in New York mm. and uh, the World Science. It's just such an opportunity to really link our art forms. I mean, I, I really believe that science is an art form as well. And and what we do is not only an art form, but also science, you know. So there, there are lots and lots of crossovers and And each complements and amplifies the other. Well said. I cannot wait to hear the end product of of this day, and I cannot wait to come back tomorrow and hear the remaining movements uh, recorded in the the Moon Symphony. Thank you both, uh, Amanda and Maren. Well, thank you so much for for getting yourself all over from the U.S. And thank you, Maren, for your absolute brilliance today. My pleasure. You're super. To be continued. And yes, and thank you to the scientists as well and the astronaut for their holding the floor for us and just just living and breathing and holding their breath and being statues up there. (laughs) Yeah, they were great. They were great. Thanks. Thank you.